thank you very much for the invitation and it's wonderful to be here. Thanks all for, for tuning in from your kitchen or wherever else you are, as we just heard. My name is Jess Roman and I work at the Institute of Public Health. And today I'll talk to you about using DAGs to investigate causal relationships in observational studies. And as mentioned in the introduction, I will give you some examples um, from my field. I'm an epidemiologist where we use actually DAGs quite often in our research, but I'll also try to draw some parallels and I hope that we can talk all together in the discussion about how DAGs could also be used for meta research. Okay, so just briefly, as I mentioned, a lot of what I do relates to the content I'm presenting today. So just in terms of an intellectual potential conflict of interest, I'm interested in this stuff please fund this stuff. <laughs> um, and actually my current position is focused on improving the quality of peer review and methods applied in biomedical research um, by the Volkswagen Foundation. And a lot of that also focuses on transparency for causal analysis using DAGs. So um, this talk is going to be short and sweet. I've given this talk uh, in a lot of different variations and formats, adapting it here and there, but I think this is the shortest talk I've given on this topic. So that's why you see the nutshell, because everything I'm telling you is in a nutshell. If there are any methodologists watching, I'm abbreviating theory substantially. So uh, that's not meant with any kind of malicious intent. Please, you know, do more reading and research, um, watch some other videos if you want to get to know more about this theory. I'm trying to give you a teaser here today with the hope that you'll think that these methods are cool and you'll want to look into them more. So what we'll do here today, I'll go through the three tasks as they call them, of health data science. I'll talk about causal thinking, introduce these DAGs to you, show you how they can use, be used for confounding, selection bias, and information bias, detection, and mitigation, and then try to wrap things up. Okay, so first, these three tasks of health data sciences. Um, there was a nice paper by Miguel Hernan. You'll see his name popping up a lot today. He's an epidemiologist who's really pushing for DAGs um, in applied research in our field and has done a lot of really great methodological research as well. And he wrote this nice uh, paper with John Su and uh, Brian Healy called A Second Chance to Get Causal Inference Right, A Classification of Data Science Tasks. And here they delineate description, prediction, and causal inference as three fields um, that, yeah, three tasks of health data science that are, let's say, useful. Classification is sometimes a bit arbitrary, but sometimes also useful in helping inform how we design, analyze, but also interpret our study findings. So just that we're all on the same page. Ah, and I should mention this article, it's actually not a new idea what was presented in that paper. To give full credit, uh, Gali Chmuli um, published a paper already back in 2010, illustrating the same sort of distinction being needed in the field. So description task. I think a lot of us are familiar with description. The idea is to perform elementary calculations, maybe even sophisticated approaches, something like an unsupervised learning algorithm. It doesn't have to be simple when you do description, maybe clever data visualizations. Um, and we use description for hypothesis generation, but sometimes also for policy making. Here's an example from my own work. Um, we looked at very early on in the pandemic, uh, all cause mortality, and you don't need pretty fancy methods to see something here was going on in the little town of Nembro in March, 2020. There were a lot of um, all-cause mortality uh, recorded in Nembro compared to the past years and months. Then we have description. Description methods, again, you can have elementary calculations, maybe a correlation coefficient or a risk difference, but also more advanced pattern recognition methods, supervised learning algorithms such as random forest, neural networks. Maybe some of you have worked with these methods. Your central interest when you're predicting is optimizing performance. So something like discrimination ability, area under the curve, calibration, calibration plots. And why do we use prediction? Why is it interesting as a task? Well, it can help us identify specific target groups, such as those who are at high risk for an outcome. So I brought the score 
um, maybe some of you have heard of this, the SCORE score, probably the most famous clinical risk prediction model for fatal cardiovascular disease in Europe. And the idea here is that with relatively few parameters, when you know, for example, um, something about a person, you can, based on the data of others, predict the risk of having a fatal cardiovascular event within 10 years. Now, I'm coming to the point of the, today's talk, which is distinct from those two tasks, which is in the domain of causal inference. And this is where we want to make a, co a comparison um, and, and hopefully estimate a causal effect. So in an RCT, I think randomized controls, uh, trials or experiments are something that people often think of when they think about causal inference. Um, let's say we're looking, we're comparing treatment A versus treatment B in preventing the outcome mortality. And let's say this is a well-conducted trial of infinite size. The mortality in arm A would be, is what would be the mortality if the population was treated with A, theoretically, and the mortality in arm B, what would be the mortality if the population was treated with B. And the true causal effect would be the contrast between these two quantities. And that's why this task actually in that original publication is called counterfactual prediction. Because of course, we don't know what would happen if we would treat the entire population with A or B. They either get A or they get B. So when we do a trial, right, we're allowing the different groups to stand in for the experience of what would have happened if. We'll come back to that in a moment. So in causal inference, we use different methods. Um, you'll see some similarities. There can be elementary calculations. There can be more complex methods. But what's always central is that causal subject matter knowledge is necessary, especially when we work with observational data. And this is often in the form of unverified assumptions that we use to guide our data analysis and justify a causal interpretation of our results. Ultimately, to make decisions and to explain, which I would argue is something that we are ultimately more interested in um, than the description or prediction tasks, especially in my domain of public health and epidemiology. These uh, terms here, I have confounding bias, selection bias, and information or measurement bias. Um, our terms we use in epidemiology, we, we mean, when we say bias, we mean systematic error in the sense that you can't reduce these biases simply by increasing your study size. So with random error, you, you increase your study size and you get better precision in your estimate. But if you have systematic error, it doesn't matter how many more people you put in your study, these biases will persist. Um, and things like confounding, selection bias, information bias, these are causal concepts. So I don't understand the meaning of confounding when we're talking about prediction. I don't understand the meaning of confounding when we talk about description. It really only takes on a meaning when we have a causal question and we're working in a causal framework. So there's a lot of confusion um, when it comes to, yeah, methods used and exactly which task a given research question belongs to. So I supervise a lot of master's thesis students, and when I hear research questions for the first time, there's some language that sounds descriptive, some language that sounds predictive, and sometimes some language that sounds like causal inference all mixed into one. And that can be because we use similar statistical techniques for example, regression-based model, uh, regression model-based approaches in all three of these tasks. On top of that, we use terminology pretty loosely um, between these different tasks. They're not, they're not distinct. So associations, predictors, independent risk factors, you'll see across all of the tasks in the literature. And sometimes the borders are blurry. So it may be that I actually am interested in finding strong causes that I want to include in my risk prediction model because causes happen to be extremely good predictors. I've done a bit of work on this. So sometimes we want to blur those borders, but as a general rule, it can be a good heuristic to try to figure out which task am I working on and which methods are most suitable. Okay, um, I really like this paper, again, Miguel Hernan, uh, the C word, 
scientific euphemisms do not improve causal inference from observational data. So the idea here is that if you have a causal question, make it explicit, make your aims explicit. Um, you'll often see this kind of foggy language of associations that's a bit confusing what's behind it, but then in the conclusion section of the paper, a really strong causal conclusion with an implication for decision making. But then it gets me to ask, was the setup, was the method used to generate this very causal sounding conclusion actually appropriate for answering a causal question? So that's why through this muddling, we may risk getting the wrong answer if we're not being super specific about what we're doing. And that's actually what we're on about with these causal inference methods, specifically with these causal diagrams, because they're about making our causal assumptions that we need to estimate cause and effect from observational data, especially explicit. And it's not a new thing. So in our field, um, these causal diagrams entered actually far before 1999, but the first really big paper where people started paying attention was probably this one here. And uh, just two years ago, JAMA picked up on this. So all of us who were doing applied work uh, in the medical domain were thrilled that now finally there was an article to cite when peer reviewers said, hey, what is this thing and why are you trying to publish it in a medical journal? Maybe what helped JAMA was the fact that uh, Guido Imbens won the Nobel Prize using causal inference methods um, in the econometrics domain but also the Rousseau Prize went to Jamie Robbins, Miguel Hernan, and others um, from epidemiology who uh, were awarded this very competitive prize for their work in causal inference. So this causal revolution, as it's been so-called termed, um, these are perhaps three of the most popular textbooks um, that are now in circulation on the topic has really taken off. And there's a lot of interest about applying these methods and applying them well to all different types of research questions um, and fields. So what is the cause? I'm an epidemiologist, as I mentioned, and in public health, we're trained to observe and count and compare. So let's say that we notice among women in Berlin, those with gray hair die more often than those without gray hair. Okay, so that's something we observe. I think everyone would agree with me that's not so surprising that we observe that. So we can do our counting and comparing our good epidemiologist two by two table. We can calculate the risk of dying within one year among the exposed and among the unexposed. We can compute our risk ratio, which shows that hmm, 1.5. So the risk is higher among those with gray hair of dying. They're dying more frequently. And that's a fact. It's true. Um, and from a population health perspective, we think, how can we remove these excess cases? Obviously, we don't want these women in Berlin to be dying. So maybe we should intervene. What can we do to help and prevent these excess cases? Should we color the hair of all the women in Berlin? We can intervene, right? We can dye the hair brown, pink, blue, as long as it's not gray. Um, might this then extend life? And, you know, probably, I can't see all of your cameras, but probably you're smiling and laughing because this is ridiculous, right? Um, we'll come back to this example later. I think it shows how we as human beings have causal intuition without even doing this experiment. We don't even need to do the trial and we know what's gonna happen. Um, but is hair color useful information? It might actually be useful in a different task, for example, prediction gray hair could be a very good predictor of death within the next year, even though I would argue just having the gray hair itself is not the cause. We'll come back to this example later. So the central problem in making causal inference or one of the biggest challenges we have, let's say, when trying to answer, answer causal questions using observational data is that we can't observe the same individuals over the same time period, both with and without the exposure. We would need a time machine for that. So how can we estimate a causal effect if it depends on quantities that would only be observable in a counterfactual world that doesn't exist? Ideally, we wanna compare two different potential outcomes as they're called or counterfactual outcomes that are arising from two hypothetical scenarios in the same individuals. 
So unfortunately, we, we're not in Back to the Future. We don't have a time machine. So we need to find a way to ensure what's called exchangeability in the causal inference language in the real world between two groups. Essentially, what this means is we need the unexposed group in a population study to represent the experience of the exposed group had they not been exposed. So we don't do this on the individual level. We compare groups and we try to find some group that stands in for what would those people have experienced had they not received the intervention, for example. Okay, so this little tiny bit of theory before we get into the practical application, we use these DAGs as a tool to visualize causal links between variables. They depict the underlying causal structure, the so-called data generation process that gave rise to the data that we observe in our data sets when we're analyzing observational studies. And they help us to set up the correct causal, let's say, statistical analysis, um, but not only of the analysis, actually also the design. We can use DAGs to figure out which variables we should adjust for, where we have to worry about potential selection bias, and maybe even mitigate such biases. And in the language of Hernan, they help us draw our assumptions before our conclusions. So even if one of these DAGs is not presented, it's just a code basically of one's assumptions. If you give me a research paper that's pretty well documented um, which variables were used for adjustment and why, I could probably retrospectively draw a DAG maybe for that paper. If it makes sense is another question, but it's just a picture of the causal assumptions. You do need subject matter knowledge to draw a DAG. There's no purely statistical rule that can uh, guide you setting up DAGs, though there is a lot of work now in causal discovery about learning um, certain patterns, not just patterns, but actually causal relationships between variables. Um, but I'm going to stick with a simple example now and say that in general, we don't use statistical rules to guide our setup of DAGs. And DAGs are non-parametric, and the rules that underpin DAGs are consistent regardless of the form of the relationship between the variables. So if, you know, something, um, yeah, it would have like a quadratic relationship, that doesn't matter in the DAG, it's non-parametric. As long as there's a cause-effect relationship between variables, you can depict the arrow in the DAG. I'll show you what that looks like. This is a DAG. Ideally, the arrows should point from left to right to reflect temporal arrangement. This convention is not an absolute rule. Sometimes it can get challenging when the DAGs get really big, but it's generally easier to display them where time goes um, from left to right. You could also do them the other way, or I've seen from top to bottom, just be consistent. And the causal flow in these DAGs, DAG stands for Directed Acyclic Graph. The causal flow happens in one direction and one direction only. Um, they're acyclic in the sense that no loops or cycles are allowed in the DAG. And yeah, they're graphs, they're visualizations, that's their purpose. And uh, they, make, they may seem very simple looking and that's exactly the point. There's a lot of complicated mathematics. I showed you a, a little teaser to the counterfactual framework um, that's actually quite extensive that, that is behind these, but the beauty, let's say, is in their simplicity. A cause that's a cause in at least some individuals should be depicted in a DAG. So it doesn't have to be a cause in everyone. That's often a question that we get uh, when, we, when we introduce DAGs. And also, if you're not sure about an arrow, the absence of an arrow is generally a stronger assumption than the presence. So if you're unsure, better to put the arrow and be on the safe side. So I told you this is a simple DAG. You probably thought, wow, I signed up for this workshop to learn about these, these great figures, and now she just shows me two, two letters and a, an arrow in between. Um, but yeah, it, it can be this simple. And on this DAG, there's only one path from the exposure A to the outcome Y. And this is the standard notation we use for the focal relationship under study. So when I ask what's the research question, in this case, it's what's the effect of A on Y. And the arrow indicates that the causal flow here is only happening from A to Y. 
So under some assumptions, which I'm not gonna get into today, there's a correspondence, a direct correspondence between the paths that are shown in a DAG and associations we observe in our data. So in general, any open path between two variables in a DAG will indicate an association in the data. So if you go into your data set, you will see, for example, that in the treated group, there are more cases of the disease than in the untreated group. You'd see some kind of relationship between those two variables. Now notice that regardless of whether the effect um, of the cause is harmful or protective with respect to the outcome, the DAG structure looks the same. So having an extra 21st chromosome leads to Down syndrome, but consuming citrus fruit protects against scurvy. So you don't have like a sign um, encoding in these DAGs. It can go in either direction of harmful or protective. It's just saying that the one is the cause of the other. Of course, you could reframe the second one as a lack of citrus fruit consumption leads to scurvy. So no difference there. I wanted to show you a slightly more complicated DAG. In this case, we have a middle variable here where A causes I, I causes Y. You've probably heard of these types of variables. I, in this case, is what's known as a mediator or intermediate. And in this particular DAG, A is only causing Y through this intermediate I. And here's that example, um, citrus fruit is a cause of vitamin C and having too little vitamin C is a cause of scurvy. But actually this entire causal mechanism wasn't known at the time when they started realizing that citrus fruit prevented scurvy. So it's not always necessary to understand all of the intricate steps in terms of intermediates in a DAG to have an impact, right? It's enough to just give, I think it was um, preserved lime juice on these ships of sailors to save a bunch of lives and prevent these scurvy cases. Only later, 1937, did it come out that vitamin C was indeed the thing in the fruit juice that was doing the job. And in fact, much of the public health research body is focused on measure, measuring the average total causal effect of a given exposure on an outcome, regardless of the path. But sometimes we do want to know more about a mechanism. And I just wanted to leave you this link here. If you're interested in such causal mediation analysis, we can talk later um, where maybe that might make sense in the meta research uh, domain. This is a really nice starting point. Tyler Vanderweel has done a lot of work in this area. All right, I wanted to show you another DAG. It's getting a little bit more complicated now. Here we see our familiar A and Y. They're still A causing Y, but now we've got another variable in the game, and this is L. And L is a common cause, or sometimes called the parent, of both A and Y. And if we're interested in estimating the causal effect of A on Y, is it possible, given this DAG? Before it was possible, we only had A and Y in the game, no problem. Now we've got this lurking variable L. Might there be another partial explanation for an observed relationship between A and Y? In other words, is there another path from A to Y? Why do I ask? I told you before that any path we have in a DAG will reveal or will, will indicate that our um, data set will show us an association between those variables. So for sure, we're going to have a relationship here through this variable L that's not the causal one of interest. So to the question, can we estimate the causal effect of A on Y given this DAG if we do nothing? Well, if we go backwards through this so-called open backdoor path, um, this means that the measured association between A and Y will not identify the causal effect because there's this problem variable L. And so if we just compute a risk ratio, let's say an odds ratio, a risk difference, whatever that effect estimate may be, um, we will have a confounded effect estimate because it's going to be a mixing of the true causal effect of interest, if there is one, and this confounding via the variable L. So this is why DAGs are really neat. They can show us confounding really, really quick if you see this structure where there's this common cause of the exposure and the outcome, the alarm bell can go off. Here's some confounding happening. 
Um, and yeah, this is this is traditionally L in this case is confound is called a confounder in this DAG. And it's important that we clearly specify the research question because I want to point out that if we change our question, if it's no longer what's the effect of A on Y, but what's the effect of L on A, now you'll see that we don't have a confounding variable for this effect. We actually just have a common consequence, which is Y. So depending on the question you're, ask, you're asking, your confounders change. So I don't know how much sense it, may, it, it makes to call, uh, to call L always a confounder if we have then a different question. All of a sudden, L is, is our um, exposure, A is our outcome, and Y is some descendant of both the exposure and the outcome, common consequence. Okay, so kind of a kind of an abstract thing with all of these letters. But uh, yeah, where do we go when we want to get our information? Twitter, of course, uh, the, the good old X. So here's a nice post from the Times Higher Education saying that academics who are tempted to remain in pajamas during the working day should think again, says a medical study that linked the practice to, the, to a deterioration in mental health. Um, and so what do we think? Is this causal or lurking? Could something else explain this observed association? And yeah, there was this nice response. This was the middle of the pandemic. Andrew Heist here on Twitter said it's time for a DAG back in the good old Twitter days. And indeed, there is a common cause of these two variables, right? It's, it's if the exposure is wearing uh, work pajamas and the outcome is deterioration in mental health, oh, what if expose things? The global pandemic. And maybe if there wasn't this global pandemic, um, we, we wouldn't see actually anything here at all. Another historical example, this one puzzled people for a long time. Um, what about the effect of birth order on Down syndrome? Babies who were born later in the line, right? So not first or second children to a mother, but third, fourth, fifth, sixth in the row, had a higher risk for Down syndrome. So again, putting on the public health hat, what do we tell people? Do we tell people you shouldn't have more than three children? You shouldn't have more than eight children? <laughs> um, no, it's actually that there's a confounding variable, maternal, maternal age, that both affects the birth order and the risk for Down syndrome. So it was actually fully explainable by the variable maternal age. And so what can we do about confounding? We can try to control it. This goes a bit outside of the scope of our talk today, but essentially what we do in the DAG is we just put a box around the thing that's a problem. Again, DAGs are very simple. What that means in practice, you're conditioning, controlling for, adjusting for that variable, and blocking a variable stops the flow through that variable and closes the open backdoor path. So just some ways to do this, I'm sure you've heard of these things, maybe restricting your analysis to a certain age, for example, stratifying, regression-based adjustment, standardization, weighting, if you've heard of the propensity score, propensity score weighting, so-called G methods, lots of options um, to deal with this problem. Essentially, as I mentioned, what you do is that you remove this open path from the DAG when you do this adjustment. So back to our first example, having gray hair and death. Is there another way to get from this variable to this variable that's not on the causal path? Yes, indeed, getting older. And if we adjusted for age, I'm sure that we would see that having gray hair doesn't increase your risk for death other than through the common cause age. So after adjusting for age, we, we probably shouldn't um, dye hair as a prevention campaign as you all correctly um, had felt through your intuition. More complex example, the DAGs could get bigger and bigger. Here we have um, the interest is in the effect of exercise on lung cancer. I added in here also another mediator by which exercise works, at least in some people, um, by this mechanism, by strengthening the immune system. And you can imagine that there are many factors that then can lead to both the exposure and the outcome. So they should also be included in the DAG. Once you have a complete DAG, you think about, okay, how do I deal with these two open backdoor paths? 
and you need to block them. And as long as you block one variable on these open backdoor paths, you can control for your confounding. So health consciousness in this DAG is something that's really hard to observe and measure, but that's okay because imagine we have smoking and age correctly measured in our data set. If this is the real truth here, it's a pretty simple DAG. We could control for confounding and we could get a correct estimate of the causal effect. And the causal effect in this case would be a combination of both the direct effect of exercise on lung cancer and this indirect effect via the mediator variable. As I said, usually we're after these total causal effects from some exposure on some outcome, not caring so much about what intermediate things happen in between, unless you want a mediation analysis. So I just want to show you using a DAG why randomization uh, and RCTs are so cool. Randomization breaks this arrow between any confounder you can think of and your exposure, as long as the randomization is done well and you have enough people in the study. Um, you can see that no backdoor paths exist because I'm letting a dice decide, essentially, whether you get the exposure or you get the comparator. That's the only factor that influences A. So anything else, diabetes, status, age, this arrow is broken. So that's why it's so cool. You don't have to worry about confounding in a trial that's conducted well, um, at least for the baseline variables. Okay, selection bias. We spend a lot of time on confounding um, as epidemiologists and when we're talking about secondary data use, but we should also pay attention to other things that can go wrong, and DAGs are super useful to detect these potential problems as well. So what about a common consequence? Here we have two variables. Now this time we have A and B that both cause C. Notice that A has no causal effect on B. So when you have these common consequence situations and you have these two arrowheads coming together in a, in, in a DAG, you can think of the information flow I mentioned earlier stopping at that variable. And we call that variable a collider because the two arrows are then colliding on that variable, on that path. And what's weird, and we don't have so much time to get into the why today, but you just, you're gonna have to believe me a bit. When you block, when you condition on, put this variable in your regression model or whatever you're doing with it, um, if you block, a collider, you actually introduce a spurious association between the two parents of that variable. That's not real. Like we do it in the analysis or the design phase by blocking the collider. So this is how we introduce collider stratification bias by stratifying on a collider. Yikes. So that doesn't sound good. So actually, if you leave the collider alone, the path is closed, all good. If you adjust for it, it opens up the path and you have a similar problem to when you have an open backdoor path for confounding. This is an open path, leaky faucet. We're not going to be able to get the right estimate of the causal effect we're after. Um, this is a type of selection bias that induces this non-causal association. And one of the examples you'll see a lot in the literature is the rain and sprinkler example. So if you know that the grass is wet, right, there's two ways for the grass to be wet. Either it could have rained or the sprinkler was on. But if you know it didn't rain, the sprinkler must have been on. That's what this is. If I have some information here, if I know the grass is wet, right, and I know it didn't rain, the sprinkler must have been on. So because I know something about B and I know what C is, I look in the stratum of the grass is wet, I now have information about A, even though we said before A and B were not related. So this takes a bit to wrap your head around. Um, I have some extra examples with me. Here's one more practical one. Um, let's say this is our DAG. Smoking causes us to carry around a lighter in our pocket. Smoking also causes lung cancer. Asbestos causes lung cancer, um, but doesn't cause you to carry a lighter, nor is it related to smoking. So if we don't do anything in this DAG, we have a collider here at lung cancer, um, if we don't do anything and we're interested in the effect, um, let's say between the exposure, in this case, having a lighter in your pocket 
and the outcome um, um, being being exposed to asbestos, we wouldn't expect seeing an association between those two variables. If we would compute something in our data set, these two variables aren't related at all. Here's the collider. There's no open backdoor path. We wouldn't see anything. What's the problem? Let's say I do a study. I work at the medical clinic among lung cancer patients. I select only on lung cancer patients like in a patient cohort study. I restrict only to this group. Notice that I'm conditioning, I'm blocking on this collider variable. These two arrows come together. And when I condition on a collider, I induce a bias between the parents. So now if I compute the crude association between the exposure and outcome among only lung cancer patients, I'm going to observe an effect. I'm gonna write up the paper and say, oh, look, there's something here between having a lighter and being exposed to asbestos. We know that that's, that's not actually linked, but we will see something if we analyze these data. And that's because we induced a spurious relationship between smoking and asbestos. And there's tons of examples of colliders all across the medical research. Um, I can really recommend these papers about the birth weight paradox, something that's puzzled epidemiologists for decades. The obesity paradox is still a more recent one that's I've really gotten arguments with my clinical colleagues about. Also, Berkson's paradox, Lord paradox, there's a bunch. And these are all just collider stratification bias. But RCTs don't have this problem, right? Well, RCTs are great. Uh, because we have randomization, and then we don't have to worry about baseline confounding if it's done well. However, as RCTs go on, sometimes people have adverse events that make them stop taking the treatment. Here, you maybe already see what's coming, two arrowheads colliding. Now, imagine that we don't have people in our study in the end who stop taking the treatment. They're not there anymore. If we adjust and we analyze only those who took the treatment until the end, we're conditioning on a child of this collider. Conditioning on the child of the collider does the same thing as conditioning on the collider itself, induces a relationship between the parents. Uh-oh, we opened a path in this case between treatment and the outcome mortality. And therefore, if we analyze the data from this RCT, we're going to actually get the wrong answer. This is known as post-randomization confounding um, that, we in, that we actually introduce. Okay, what about experimental studies? And then I'll wrap up. Uh, we did a, a study um, together with some folks at the Quest looking at, um, yeah, laboratory animals. A similar, a similar case here, say that researchers are interested in estimating the causal effect of some treatment A on final infarct volume in a mouse model. And here we have a W, which stands for animal welfare, and S for survival status. L is here the initial infarct volume. Um, if we know the absolute truth, this would be the DAG. You see the similar structure as we just saw, a collider at welfare. Of course, if the animals who are not doing well don't survive to the end of the study or have to be euthanized um, because of their bad state, we then only end up with animals in the study who were, were ultimately selected and remained in the study. If this happens, we induce um, an association between the exposure and this initial infarct size variable, and we would have then a collider bias if we tried to estimate the effect. The good news is we can also block this backdoor path that we opened um, because we made the selection and we can then adjust our collider bias back out. So it's not hopeless. We can mitigate these biases, but you have to know something about the causal structure. And that's why it's worth doing this exercise where you um, draw the DAG and try to diagnose these biases, ideally before you do the study so you can um, accommodate them in the design and analysis. And here you can see, um, especially when the attrition frequency of the animals gets very high, um, that your naive estimate with no adjustment can show even a very, very strong effect when actually there's no effect at all of the treatment on the outcome in the mice. Really interesting stuff. Um, yeah. I, I won't go into too much detail here, but perhaps you've seen some of these approaches to select covariates for adjustment if you're doing observational analyses. All of these p-value based univariable selection 
um, so-called effect estimate change, change in estimate approaches have been debunked as problematic. So I wouldn't use these statistical rules to guide your selection of variables to control for confounding or selection bias. I would say that the best practice is to draw a DAG and to think about common causes. All right, and this is a one-slider. Teaser slide, because information bias never gets enough attention, but it can also be depicted in a DAG and addressed using um, causal diagrams and causal inference approaches. If you're interested in that, like measurement error, have a look at this paper, um, but it's a great tool also for that. So to wrap up, um, I wanted to show you these two papers where DAGs have been used or could be useful in meta research. The first one just came out. This is from a, a colleague of mine, Jeremy from the Netherlands, and he and his colleagues um, put together how DAGs could be used to enhance the design of systematic reviews and meta-analyses. So I thought for a lot of the work in meta-research, um, these approaches are used and maybe it could be interesting to some of you. And then I wanted to show you another study by Peter Tennant and colleagues where they looked at how DAGs are being used and reported in practice. This study is a bit older. It was published in 2021 and the sample was older than that. I think things have gotten better since this study was published, but it showed that a lot of the DAGs published in medical research were not particularly great. So there's still work to do even within the field and the users of DAGs could be improved. Um, but it definitely is a good tool to display assumptions transparently and allow us to essentially evaluate the quality of what others have done in this domain. I would suggest that you report these DAGs in the method sections of your paper if you use them. I think it's a really great tool to have discussions, for example, with peer reviewers about your causal assumptions. It's the opposite of black, black box approaches, basically. And you should also reflect on potential biases identified by your DAG and address them. And as always, ensure that your methods, results, and interpretation match your research question. I think I will just close here so we have some time to discuss. I'll leave it on my takeaway slide. And I just want to thank um, some of my colleagues who inspired this talk and leave you with also some some additional resources you can learn more. I'm happy to share these slides. I know it was a lot of content and I'm eager to hear what you think.